Hello everyone. Last time we stopped until this page. Um, basically, we we were discussing on the elements or the equations that constitute Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, so basically, we understand that the Navier-Stokes equations comprise of the continuity equations, momentum equations, as well as the energy equation. So the details uh, will be discussed in detail um, further uh, down uh, this semester. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so uh, when we discuss about the CFD process or the procedure, uh, we need to understand. Uh, we discuss a bit right, at the start of the previous lecture. Uh, basically, we need to have the problem, we identify the problem, the domain, and then we uh, proceed to pre-processing and post-processing. Okay. So this is the detailed uh, solution procedure, the general uh, the, uh, process, the pro general procedure that is commonly used for any CFD processes. Okay, so let's uh, discuss in detail. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, you need to have a computational domain, of course. Okay. So once you have that uh, chosen and you have the mesh generated, okay, or also known as grid, okay, uh, basically what it means when you have a mesh generated over the domain is basically you split or you divide the domain into many, many small elements that are called uh, cells. Okay? So the elements that you see that, uh, where the triangles are structured, for example, they are just um, cells basically um, that's where or at the face of the elements uh, that's where the computation uh, is being done okay so after you have the mesh generated um, then you have boundary conditions um, where you need to specify um, for example if you just have a simple channel like the example that we have over here okay so you need to specify uh, common uh, boundary conditions that usually uh, usually that that must have uh, in any CFD problems uh, we have the inlet uh, we have the outlet and we have the wall so for example uh, this is just an example of something similar that you will be doing in the second lab okay? so you were given a schematic diagram so you need to identify which one is the inlet okay for example we know the inlet is uh, the one or the, the interface that is closer to the object. Uh, and then, because we want to uh, examine or explore the wake generated by the object, the flow behind uh, the object. So we have a, a longer domain at the back or downstream of the object. Okay? So we have inlet on the left and then we have outlet uh, at the back. Okay? So we have top wall. And then from this is from the front view. This is from the side view. So from uh, from the front view, you have uh, basically you define the wall on either side of the channel okay, or the rectangle. Okay. So that's the boundary basically. You need the boundaries uh, in order to specify or to impose uh, the values of the problem. Okay. So next, um, and then you specify the type of fluid that you use. So for example, uh, if you have a fluid going inside this domain, then you have to specify the fluid, uh, what type of fluid, for example, is it water, is it gasoline? Uh, most of the properties uh, has been uh, stored or has been uh, compiled in ANSYS. Uh, but for example, if you are dealing with something exotic or something that uh, is novel that um, that is not in the database you can always give some values or properties to the new uh, or you can create a new uh, properties or a new fluid in in the uh, NC solution or in NC uh, boundary setup okay so this is where after uh, you have the mesh you set the boundary then you specify the fluid or the interaction uh, wall uh, fluid and also the relevant information, for example, the temperature, the density, viscosity, etc. Okay. Next, we have the numerical parameters and solution algorithm selected. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So after that, um, 
Then you have a starting value for all flow free uh, flow field uh, variables are specified for each cell. Okay, so basically you need to specify. Okay, first you have to name or you have to select. Okay, this is my inlet. This is my outlet. You have to name the face. Okay. Um, once you have that, so for example, in your second lab, it will be quite simple. It will be quite straightforward. You have a rectangle uh, as your domain. Okay, for example, this is your front view. Okay. So you specify the inlet, for example, the inlet is, for example, just one meter per second, and you have turbulent intensity as five meter per second. So the turbulent intensity, five sec, uh, sorry, it's not five second, five percent. So what does it mean, uh, turbulent intensity? Uh, as you know, for all flow, uh, there will be some sort of turbulence, a uh, mixing happening. So turbulence is just uh, flows mixing, vortices, uh, okay? So what does it mean is, um, the speed or the the length taken for the flow to mix basically okay for example if you have a turbulence intensity of 100 percent what does it mean is basically you are saying the flow basically once it passes through an object or obstacles it will immediately uh, converge and basically recovers the velocity and basically will flow behind or downstream the object as the uh, initial uh, inlet velocity that we specified. So 5%, basically what it means of 5, 10, 15, for example, it depends on the application. 5% basically means uh, it takes times uh, for the velocity to recover its initial value, which is your inlet velocity. So for example, if you put one meter per second, so if it goes in, um, into our domain, one meter per second over here, then after it passes to our object, then you will have a wick behind this. You will have deceleration at the back, okay? Because uh, it needs uh, the conservation of momentum and energy basically is specified. It cannot be basically destroyed, so it just needs to recover. So you have a mixing over here at the back. Then after a while, maybe at a certain distance, the initial velocity so let's say this is one meter per second at the back immediately you will have maybe 0 0.5 0 0.4 and then it started increasing uh, as it goes further downstream okay. so five meter per second means it takes a while for the velocity to recover while if you have 90 or 100 percent in table intensity means once it passes through the object then there will be no mixing basically the, the mixing will happen al almost instantaneously then you will have uh, the initial velocity recovered immediately around this region okay? directly or immediately downstream of the object okay so that's what turbulent intensity means the intensity of the mixing or the turbulence itself okay and then of course you have inlet and you have the outlet so you have to specify okay one thing over here that you need to understand is that uh, we're going to discuss further later uh, for the boundary you cannot have the same boundary uh, set for both inlet and outlet. So if you have inlet as velocity, you impose velocity uh, parameters. Then for the outlet, usually we are going to use uh, either uh, pressure, for example. Okay, pressure you set to zero. But because we want to let the uh, flow uh, goes through the outlet, okay, basically uh, moving out of the domain. Because if you put both inlet and outlet using the same uh, setting for example you're using velocity or pressure both uh, velocity or both pressure then you will have uh, error in your domain basically okay then of course uh, aside from the inlet and outlet uh, the, re the remaining uh, basically is just the wall so you have the uh, wall okay so you can specify uh, the condition of the wall whether it is slip no slip or maybe it's sure. Okay, so you can specify that. Okay. Uh, just one note that I want to make right now is that <clears throat> uh, when you choose no slip uh, condition uh, for the wall, it doesn't mean that there will, there will be uh, the the wall will be smooth. So it's not the same. Okay. So even you you uh, choose no slip condition for your wall, it doesn't mean that you are going to have a smooth uh, surface. Okay. So for example. Uh, the one okay this is the example of an object okay, this is quite similar to your second lab okay so you have an object you have an inlet and you have an outlet okay so basically uh, so if you go back a bit uh, for the velocity uh, for the inlet and outlet 
<coughs> so you can see that uh, the velocity is pretty much consistent throughout the domain uh, as one meter per second, okay, roughly the orange color. Then it decelerates uh, once it encounter the object, okay, so obstacle, so it decelerate. Okay, but remember conservation of momentum and mass. So once it decelerate, some uh, it needs to recover the energy. So if you have deceleration, then it must be accompanied by acceleration, meaning that you have acceleration uh, on the top and bottom sides of the object. Okay, because then the uh, momentum needs to be constant. So immediately behind the object, we'll have a velocity deficit because that's where the mixing happening. So if you see over here, the wick is quite, quite long. So that's because we set our turbulent intensity to be 5%. If, for example, you set your turbulent intensity to a higher value, for example, 50%. So you are going to get roughly half of the wick that you see in this picture. Because the higher value means the faster rate of recovery. Okay? So after the, uh, after the wick, what happens after this point is that the flow fully recovers, meaning that you get back to the orange region, meaning that uh, the initial velocity is recovered. So you get one meter per second at the back. So let's go back about the, the wall uh, setting. So for the wall setting, um, basically when you set the no slip condition, I think that's a misconception because it says no slip. No slip, okay, it can be misconstrued uh, or uh, it can be a misconception among students saying that or no slip means it's going to be a smooth surface. Uh, it's not like that. Okay, uh, you need to understand all materials has a friction, regardless whether we set our uh, setting to be no slip condition. Okay, frictions exist everywhere. So, for example, uh, what we have over here at the bottom. Okay, so if you set this as a no slip condition, the friction at the bottom, the uh, due to the bottom, the bed, the bed of the channel. Right? There's still, still some sort of friction happening between the surface of the bottom, the bed over here, okay, let's say the channel bed, and also the fluid. Okay? So the interaction between the fluid at the bottom here okay, causes is what you uh, what you see this the color at the bottom means that uh, there is some value, there is some deceleration. Okay? So if you notice, if you remember, uh, if I can quickly with some notes over here. If you remember what you learned in fluid mechanics courses, uh, usually for fluid in a channel or in a rectangular flume, the velocity profile can be drawn some, uh, to be something like this, meaning that you have the highest velocity near the surface because this, the, the surface is basically a free surface. There is no friction. So there is no uh, color. So basically, there's no different in color here. Means that the surface is at uh, one meter per second, similar to the inflow. Okay. So the highest velocity is at the surface. But as you go down here, because you have rocks, for example, bottoms or rough surfaces at the bottom, so you are going to have some sort of friction. So this is because of the no slip uh, condition uh, chosen. If you want a smooth bottom, for example, you should choose your shear condition to be zero, meaning that you choose shear and then you set the shear values to be zero. Okay, so if you go, if you go through, uh, through the points over here, okay, we uh, put all the values and then we begin the initial guesses if you have. Then, of course, uh, you need to understand for the CFD, uh, most of the solvers are using uh, it, it solve the computation using iteration. So this is basically what you are seeing over here. This this plot basically shows the iteration of your calculation. So uh, the commonly asked question from students: What are the commonly used values uh, for the iterations here? Uh, that's very subjective. It depends on the complexity of the problem. If you are seeing, uh, solving a very, very simple flow, as you can see over here, the iteration has converged roughly maybe 70 or 80 iterations. After 70 or 80 iterations, uh, the calculation has converged, meaning that it has reached stability. The value is acceptable to be used as the post-processing or as the output. 
But if you have a more complicated problem, uh, a mixing between two different uh, fluids, for example, uh, you might want to have or you might want to set uh, a higher uh, iteration numbers. But remember, last time we talked about this plot, um, not all problems will exhibit a similar characteristic or flow characteristic. Sorry, not flow characteristic, plot characteristic like this. Not everything will look like this. Some of it will show some fluctuation before it in a stability. Okay? So this is what we want. Once it reached stability, meaning that the fluctuation is reduced or uh, has been uh, calculated uh, out of the equations, then you can use whatever remaining at the back uh, where the stability has been achieved. Uh, basically, you understand, okay, this is acceptable. The result has achieved equilibrium, basically. Okay? But some of the plots, residual plots for the iterations or for the convergence, uh, basically, is a zigzag pattern. For example, when you, know, when you are dealing with the dynamic uh, mesh, when you have a rotational body in your domain, so the plot will definitely uh, look different than what you have over here. So this plot corresponds to something uh, that you have over here. For lab two, for example, you have a static object. You just want to check the flow passing through the obstacle. So your plots or your uh, convergence plot will look similar to what we have over here. Okay. So remember, the convergence plots depends on the problems that you are dealing with. Uh, so once the solution has converged, the flow field variables such as velocity and pressure are plotted and analyzed graphically. So this is the first phase, basically. Um, if you notice, there is a huge fluctuation. Uh, even after 300 or 500 iterations, your, your plot still has a converge or rich stability, meaning that, for example, we, it will always start with a huge fluctuation like this. And then after a while, it will reach plateau. Or, uh, or smooth uh, surface, uh, sorry, smooth uh, line. So this indicates equilibrium or convergence. Okay. This happens because remember uh, when the the when the calculation uh, is first uh, uh, is first computed or run, it is basically just a guessing game. It doesn't know the exact value at the end. So it's just basically just putting some random value, and then from that random value, you are going to reduce the error to reintroduce a smaller value or closer value to the uh, to the final target. Okay, so that's how that's why you are getting this huge fluctuation. For example, you see over here uh, at the start of your computation, it's normal because the software or the the numerical scheme is trying to make the best guess because it is iteration. Remember, iteration means you have no idea uh, of the the correct value. But you make a guess, okay? Uh, maybe the correct value is 10, for example, 10 meter per second. But the software doesn't know that. So the software needs to start with a random value. So it starts maybe, for example, with a 1 meter per second. So 1 to 10, okay, there is a huge gap. So after uh, the first iteration, 1 meter per second, for example, then it will start guessing a value closer to 10. For example, maybe after 1, it goes to 2.5. And then it's getting closer and closer and closer. So that's how you get once the value of the guessing value is closer enough to the final value that uh, the physics or the mathematics agree on, then you get something like this. Okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, get ourselves acquainted with some of the commonly used mesh terminology. All right, so for example, what you have over here, this is a commonly used, for example, element. You can call it grid, mesh, or elements. Okay? Uh, mostly, we are dealing with 3D mesh. Okay? Uh, previously, why people are uh, dealing with 1D or 2D problems? Because the computational resources 20 years ago or 15 years ago uh, were not as great as what we have now. For example, Right now, you can get a six core a processor for probably uh, for the full set of CPU with six core processor, maybe less than 4,000 ringgit. But 10 years ago, that would probably cost maybe 15,000, 20,000 ringgit, or maybe more. So, 
So that's why, because we are really dealing with 2D, 2D is simple, uh, simpler than 3D, uh, 3D problems. So for 2D problems, previously, uh, most of the applications basically just can show a 2D site, X and Y. But now when we're dealing with 3D, we can have X, Y, and Z exist. Okay, we can see in detail. Save. All right, so let's have a look. First, we have the cell. Cell is basically just the control volume into which the domain is broken up. Cell is quite similar to elements, basically. So let's say this is our problem. We have a square. We want to solve that problem. So um, in CFD or FEA, for example, the problem is being cut or maybe divided into smaller pieces. Okay? Instead of solving one huge chunk, we are now solving the problem at one element or one cell at one time. Okay? So this is cell. Okay? And then we have a node. The okay, node is basically the intersection or the grid point. So if you look at here for the 3D cell, for the 3D uh, mesh, the node is basically the intersection between cells. Okay. Then we have cell center basically just in the middle of the cell or element. Okay. We have the edge, which is the boundary of, of the face. So for example, this is our uh, element, for example, for our object. The edge is basically just at the end of uh, the object. Okay. Then we have the face boundary of a cell. Okay. Of course, a face is just quite straightforward. Okay. Since this is our cell, when we have the face, a zone is just a grouping of nodes, faces, and cell. Okay. And then domain is basically group of node, face, and cell zone uh, as a collective um, object. So, for example, uh, this is my uh, my previous work. Basically, this is my domain. So what we have over here is a combination of structured and unstructured mesh in one domain. So domain is a collection of all nodes. So you can see that the dot over there. So that's nodes, and also fair face uh, or the elements and also the cell zones. So all that is combined into a domain. Okay. So the main thing that you need to understand is the node. Node basically is the intersection. Okay. The boundary phase, phase is basically just the element phase. The edge is just at the, uh, at the edge, okay, at the end of the object. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is again an example of our uh, definition of the boundaries or the domain. Okay. So if this is for 2D, if we have a domain, so our cell is in the middle, for example, the boundaries basically the the outer domain. So that's our boundary. We need to specify the outer uh, walls as the boundaries. Okay. Uh, and then of course the, the rest is just your conditional domain. Okay. Cell, this is just a simple of one cell. Okay. We have maybe hundreds of thousands of cells here. So for 3D, okay, you have a, a three-dimensional uh, properties right now. So you need to specify the boundaries, uh, for example, for the bottom or maybe side uh, side wall or maybe the face as well. Um, so some notice over here, I have, I have been emphasizing this uh, from day one. Do not proceed with CFD calculations unless you have generated a high quality mesh. So hopefully over the course, over this course, uh, until the end of the semester, uh, when we uh, had, uh, when we have our hands on uh, application, which is the lab, two labs, and also the case study, hopefully you can understand, you can appreciate the importance of generating a high quality mesh. How are we supposed to know whether the mesh quality uh, is okay or not? Uh, that's what we're going to cover in this course. Okay. Right. Okay. Again, this is an uh, example of my previous work that I did for my PhD study. Uh, so as you can see over here, this is what I call as a large scale simulation. Okay. So previously we covered, okay, for example, um, we look at just a simple object, let's say a square object, and you have elements or the mesh generated. So for example, this object here, uh, we just have, for example, four, three, 12, 16 elements on its face. But for a more complex, uh, more complex application, we can have several um, mesh or elements that is being imposed on one another, meaning that you can have 
a combination of structured and also unstructured grid in your domain. Okay. So let's have a look. This is what we call as a multi gridding. Okay. Solutions of the equations of motions are obtained on the coarse grid first, and then it goes further into the more refined grid and then the finest grid. Okay. So the purpose is to speed up convergence. So let me explain by using the examples that we have over here. So this is my uh, my domain. Okay. So large scale application because this is basically a uh, Scotland mainland. This is basically a mainland, uh, a, a landmass. Okay. And this, what we have over here, is basically an archipelago or a collection of islands. Okay. And my study area is basically in the middle here. They call it Pentland Firth. Okay. So the deep is Pentland Firth. All right. So my study area here, if you can see over here, is these three red dots. Okay, I'm interested to get the flow properties at these three locations so that I can validate my simulation, the data from here, from the extracted data, to be validated against experimental data where uh, people went to this location, um, they put a buoy um, in, uh, around that particular location to extract the velocity uh, in that particular area region. Okay. So if for my domain, because I'm interested in getting the flow properties for this region, you can see that first I have a coarser mesh okay, outside of my area of interest. Okay. Coarser, if you look over here, okay, is 3000 meter. So just to give you some perspective, the mesh that you commonly use for your FYP or maybe for our lab is maybe about, I don't know, two meters or one meter, 0 0.5 meters. But now my mesh size for one element is 3000 meters. So that shows the scale or uh, the, 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 the scale or this perspective of the, the domain is huge. Okay? So 3000 meters roughly outside and then from 3000 meters, I have to refine my mesh. Okay, because if you remember, uh, for this particular uh, computational software, the calculation will be centered uh, in the middle of the element, meaning that all the values will be taken or will be computed in the middle of the element. So if my element is huge, the average value computed will be also inaccurate. So I need to have a smaller uh, mesh size or elements near the uh, area of interest. So from 3000, then I have 200 meter my element size as I get closer to my first uh, area of interest. Okay? So this dot here in the square, which is, uh, when we enlarge into C, yeah? so this is B. Okay? And then for C, C is this particular region. So for C, from 200 meter, then the smallest region that I have is 50 meter. Okay, I try to use a, uh, a, a smaller mesh generation than 50 meter, but it's almost impossible to get uh, at that point. Okay, I, I keep on getting an error. So the smallest mesh node or region that I get was 50 meter. Okay, so you can see the, the generation from 3000 meter, then it goes to 200 meter, then Finally, 50 meter. Okay. So you can basically see the interaction between larger, or we call it a coarser grid, into a valley or highly refined grid at the area of interest. Okay. So this is what I want you to basically focus to understand uh, for your second lab as well as as well as for your case study. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not feasible to have a highly refined domain. For example, you want to put, uh, you want to create a mesh that is uh, uniform. For example, 200 meters for the whole domain. It's, it's just not, it's not impossible, but it's not feasible. Um, and it's not the right thing to do. Why? Because if you just want to uh, analyze or you want to explore this region, okay, the rest might not be as important. So you just focus on the area of interest so that the computation there will be more accurate 
and finally it gets to the point of interest. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, we covered before we have structured grid, we have unstructured grid, we can have a combination of both okay, unstructured grids. Unstructured grid is usually a triangle, and unstructured grid is usually a square or a quadrilateral. Okay, it doesn't have to be a square, it depends on the shape. I think last time we have a look if you have a circular face. So when you're using unstructured grid, there, there might be some skewness uh, involved because the uh, the element of the structured grid has to basically bend or uh, try to reshape uh, the, the correct face of the circle. Okay. All right. So one metric that can be used to analyze uh, the quality of your mesh in NCs is called skewness. Okay. So what is skewness basically for uh, NCs? So if you go to mesh, Okay, you can go to mesh metric. You can select skewness. Okay. So you are, you are going to get something like this. Um, a plot, um, a bar plot that shows uh, a range from 0 to 1. The highest is 1, smallest is uh, 0. Okay. So what does it mean basically? The spectrum, the spectrum from 0 to 1. Okay. So it basically implies if you got your skewness analysis mostly centered or mostly focused on uh, the value between 0 to 0 to uh, 0 0.25 it means your mesh generation is very very good excellent but as you go uh, closer and closer to one it means that there is a huge skewness happening in your mesh okay for example between 0 0.98 to one so it is unacceptable. It's very, very bad. Okay. So what does it mean by three screens? So if you have an equilateral uh, triangle over here for your mesh, skewness means it is skewed, meaning that it's no longer a perfect shape. Okay. It has to be skewed because it needs to accommodate certain shape, for example, as we mentioned just now. If you have a circular uh, face and you use structured grid, then your Square elements will no longer be square around the face because it needs to accommodate the shape. It has to change the shape in order to capture the, the real shape or the, or the object or the geometry of the object. Okay, so for quad equivalent, uh, for for example, this element, the quad element, skewness means you are going to get something like uh, is it kind of a rhombus? Okay, so there is some sort of distortion happening. So skewness is basically distortion happening for your elements okay um so basically what you want to do once you generated your mesh in NCs, have a look at the metric choose skewness and have a look if the majority of your mesh metric is focused on or is majority is being uh, located uh, between 0.25 uh, or between 0.5 maximum for example it means your mesh is very, very good. But if majority of your mesh generated is located between this one, this region, between 0.9 to 1, means there is something problem with your mesh. Okay. So when uh, or how is it relevant to your work, um, this metric? Okay. First, the question is, when are you going to get this kind of value? between 0.8, even 0.8 is quite high. Okay, but sometimes you cannot run. Maybe you can get just maybe a very small percentage. Uh, maybe one or two elements is located here near 0.9 or 0.8. There's nothing that you can do. Maybe you can just accept it. But if majority of the elements uh, are located in this region, so you need to modify your mesh. Okay. When are you going to get your skewness closer to 0.9 to 1? when you have a complex geometry. Okay. Even by using unstructured grid, sometimes, for example, if you have a sharp corner, for example, um, let's just say a calculator here. Okay. I hope you all can see this. Okay. If you have this calculator, let's say you are going to design a new calculator, but suddenly you have a sharp corner over here. So this sharp corner will usually 
introduce a problem, high skewness, okay, because it needs to accommodate the, the, the sharpness, okay, because there is no uh, elements, uh, properties or element size that can properly accommodate the sharp edges. Okay? So even for the calculator, as, as you can see over here, they use chamfer okay, or fillet in order to reduce stresses, for example. And also when you do CFD, it will reduce the skewness around the edges. Okay? All right. So some other methods that can be used to check the mesh quality is even in this way. So please have uh, please have a read. Okay. Okay. So again, this is an example of the mesh skewness. Okay. So if you can look over here, uh, the mesh generated for this shape is quite nice. Uh, you have a structured grid. Uh, uh, on the outside, okay, for, uh, farther, okay, basically outside of the area of interest, let's say, assuming this object is our area of interest, further uh, from the object, you have quite a large element. But as you go on, you can see that the mesh is being highly refined. Okay? But there's not much of skewness, uh, meaning that the element size or the element shapes, uh, they are not uh, distorted uh, extremely. But if you can see, on the second pictures on the right here, okay. Uh, excuse me, let's go back. This is by using, I think, structured grid. Okay, the, the, the choice of mesh is quite important in CFM, CFD. Uh, we are going to discuss later basically the pro and cons of structured and unstructured. But as you can see over here, um, the, the unstructured mesh is quite powerful because it can capture uh, complex shapes. But for unstructured grid, okay, if we use structured, uh, sorry, for, for structured grid, for example, if you use to capture this shape, you can see that there is some distortion happening. So this is skewness. And skewness may pose problem uh, in the calculation. Okay, so that's why you need to check your mesh metric. Okay. Even though structured grid uh, poses problem when we are dealing with uh, complex shapes, okay, but the the good thing about structured grid is that they are more faster uh, to be computed, meaning that uh, when you have structured grid over your object, over your domain, the computation, uh, the, computation uh, the computational resources as well as the time required to finish the, cal the calculation will be much, much faster compared to the uh, unstructured grid. Okay. Okay. So the question that I have over here, <coughs> do you need to check the students of each element? So here, once you finish, the, uh, it goes back to the mesh metric. When, when you check the mesh metric for the skewness, if you notice, for example, maybe just, or maybe one, or maybe just five or 10 elements out, out of 1,000 or 2,000 elements uh, that requires attention, meaning that only 10 elements out of 1,000 is in the region that is closer to 0 0.9, for example. 0 0.9 is still okay. Because if you take the ratio or if you take the statistic, 10 out of 2,000 elements, that is still acceptable. But if the majority of the mesh, for example, uh, the elements, let's say uh, 1,000 out of 1,500 elements are located uh, between 0 0.8 to 0 0.95, the skewness, then something must be done. You have to check again your object, for example, Maybe you need to refine the edges instead of you have sharp corners, you have a fillet, for example. Again, remember CFT is all about simplification and assumptions. Sometimes if you cannot um, replicate uh, the real physical uh, issues or problem 100%, what you need to do is make simplifications. Okay. Okay. Uh, so just a, a little bit about uh, again about mesh. We talk about skewness. Now we talk about the conformal or non-conformal. In NCS, they call it shared topology. Uh, basically, what it means is the connectivity. Uh, okay, so it's important to understand the concept of connectivity. Uh, <coughs> okay, we discussed before. You have one object, okay, and the object is basically is in the domain. 
your domain is now being divided into smaller elements. Okay, it can be thousands. Okay. All the elements, basically, uh, the computations will be done on the face of the elements. Okay. So the most important thing is to ensure that the elements are properly connected to one another. So let's have a look. What does it mean by connectivity or conformal or the topology? So if you have over here something here, this is an example of conformal interface, meaning that all the faces are connected. So remember, let's say this is you have two sets of uh, mesh setup structured and unstructured over here. So you can see for the structured grid, it's nicely done, and then you have unstructured grid over here. So the interface between the structured and unstructured need to meet or need meet, uh, need to be connected nicely. Okay. So you can see over here the interface is here. This is the interface between the two mesh setup. You can see that the structured grid, when they meet with the unstructured grid, they share the same face, the same cell face. Okay, this is what we discussed before. So, one, for example, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on and so forth. So, the face are connected nicely like this. Okay, this is what we call conformal or a good connectivity. But if you have poor connectivity or non conformal interface, okay, what it means is the faces are not connected. Okay. If you can see over here, this is the interface between structured and unstructured grid. Yes, they are touching uh, one another, but remember in CFD, it's all about meshing. Does the cell face uh, connect between one face to another face? Okay. If you can see over here, we have one cell face from the structured grid, but we have several different faces from the unstructured grid. So what you have is something like this. Okay. So you have, let's say this is from our first uh, zone. The second zone needs to meet something like this. It needs to be met okay, nicely like this. So that we have, they have this, the common face, the common touching uh, region. But if you have something like this, where for example, you have domain one and this is domain two, which is what we have over here. Let's say this is one, this is two. You can see that there are several nodes that is touching within the cell face of domain one. Okay, so this is a problem. It's not connected. So the the correct or the best way, uh, the the right way is basically we need to have a connectivity like this. Same nodes, and then elements sharing the same node as well as the same cell size. Okay. So in order, because remember, when you divide all the cells or the elements, the computations uh, are being calculated or being done on each element. So you need to have a smooth flow from one cell to another cell. So in order for flow, uh, for flow to pass from one phase of volume to one another, the two entities must be connected. Okay. So this is an example of good connectivity. These are an example of a very, very poor connectivity. Yes, two domains, they have a, bit, a shared interface, but the elements itself, they are not touching one another. They are not sharing common interface. Okay. So conformal mesh basically means nodes are shared at the interface between entities, as I showed just now. Okay. Non-conformal, basically, nodes are not shared, uh, not shared uh, at the interface. Okay. okay, so let's continue. So th again, this is another ex example when we enlarge uh, our mesh. So the maximum tolerance, okay, the problem, eh, the maximum tolerance between the two interfaces should not be larger than the adjacent cell size. Okay, if you can look, see over here, okay, we have two basically two sets of elements. So this is the outer cell, which is two cores, meaning that the element is huge. Okay, so this is domain one, 
and we have domain two. Okay, the inner cell, cell is too refined. So you can see over here, this is the cell uh, cell phase of the first domain, which is the huge element. It's not touching any of the element phase of the inner domain because the in, inner domain is too refined. Okay, so when you have something like this then you will have problems because the computation will be uh, or will produce error okay the calculation cannot be uh, started it will start but it will produce error okay so that's why mesh is very very important you will encounter this uh, a lot okay i think this is quite basic because in your ifip even uh, when you are doing something usually it will involve two interfaces uh, either the outer domain and the object inside the domain that you are interested uh, to study. Okay. So, for example, if we have a domain like this, simple one, and if you have a car inside, for example, if you want to study the aerodynamics, you need to make sure that the interface between the object, which is the car, and the domain, this is the domain, they must be connected. The mesh must be connected. Okay. So these are some of the examples that I can show uh, regarding the, the conformal or shared topology. Yeah? They call it uh, shared topology uh, in NCIS. Okay, you can see over here, you have two different domains or two different uh, connections. So this is, let's say, object one. This is second object. Okay? So you can see that the interface between the two objects, the elements face, they must share the same element face. Okay, they are met quite nicely. They are generated quite nicely. Okay, but as you can see over here, as we go further down, the nodes no longer sharing. See, the nodes here, they are not sharing with the nodes on domain one. This will cause problem okay, in the computation. Okay, we will produce error. Okay, even though it matches uh, up here, but it doesn't match. The uh, interface doesn't match down here. Okay. And this is again, uh, if you can look over here, uh, I think this is an example of good uh, conformal mesh. You can see here, I'm sorry, uh, the figures uh, is not quite, the quality is not quite good, but you can see that there is an uh, intersection over here which shares the same cell face. Okay. So the, the mesh is generated quite nicely. Okay. All right, so we discussed about skewness before. Uh, skewness basically means distortion. Okay, so if you have a rectangle, something like this, this is zero skewness. But when you have a high skewness, meaning that the shape is being distorted from the original shape into something else. Okay, same the similar to what you have over here. If you had quadrilateral cell, skewness means you have a huge distortion like this. Okay, so um, okay. Um, so let's discuss about mesh consideration. Uh, I think we covered a bit this uh, when we first start our lecture uh, for this one. So the the choice of mesh is very very important. Uh, look at the problems that um, that you are you have at hand. Uh, I can you immediately or choose directly uh, unstructured mesh for all applications. Or can you use a combination of these two type of mesh? Or maybe you want to use unstructured mesh for whatever reason. So let's have a look at this simple, simple example. You have uh, a cylinder, okay, which have the same dimension. Okay. Now, if you can look over here, the left uh, figures or the left cylinder is uh, basically, uh, computer uh, is imposed using the structured machine, while on the right side using unstructured machine. Okay. So if you can see over here the number of nodes. Okay, remember what is node? Nodes basically just inter intersection the dot here. The nodes for the unstructured grid is roughly about three thousand one hundred, while the nodes for the unstructured is roughly about two thousand five hundred, roughly. Okay, but the number of elements. The number of elements is roughly about 3,000 for structured 
but it increased almost fourfold or threefold to almost 11,000 for the unstructured, unstructured place. Okay. Now, both of them were set by using the same element size, which is 0 0.25. Okay. So what does it mean? What does this simple mesh setup uh, give us? What does it give us uh, the perspective or the insights? Okay. First, you can just look at the elements. Remember that the elements that's where the computation is going to be done, okay? either at the face or at the nodes. Okay, let's say assuming at the face. Okay. Now, if we have an element of 3,000 versus 11,000, okay, just by looking at the numbers alone, it is safe to say that the time or the computational resources required to solve this particular object, okay, assuming everything else is the same except for the mesh setup, the computational resources required to solve this unstructured mesh might be higher. Meaning that it's, it's going to take longer and it might need more power. Okay? So longer calculations and more resources compared to structured grid. Okay? Using the same element size, but because it's just 3,000 uh, elements, it will be quicker. Okay. So the question is, which of these two you are going to use? Can I just say, oh, if that's the case, don't choose a structured grid because it has uh, a larger elements, hence it will going to take a longer time to compute. No, it's not as simple as that. Uh, several factors uh, you need to take into consideration. Among them is basically the the problem itself, what are you trying to solve? Is it important for you to have a detailed mesh size like this? And do you have the resources required? For example, can your can your CPU or your laptop run uh, up until, for example, 20,000 elements, 30,000 elements? It depends on the capability of your soft, uh, capability of your uh, hardware as well as the problem itself. Does it need to have a detail or a large number of elements uh, to solve. Okay. So in this case, uh, this again relates to your second lab. Uh, you need to consider two options. Okay. Uh, when you are dealing, for example, again, I give you a simple example, an object in a channel, because this is what your second lab will be. Okay. For machine setup in MCs, you have two options. Actually, you have two major main options, but we have sub options, uh, sub um, criteria uh, below them. Okay, so what? But we are going to just discuss the details uh, of the two main options. You have global meshing, meaning that it is auto generated if you choose this. So once you set zero point two five, for example, for global mesh, it will give the same value for the domain as well as for the area of interest. So for example, if this is our area of interest, the object here, we want to see the flow passing through the object. If you use a mesh, global mesh setting, what it will give is the same value 0 0.25 for both domains as well as your area of interest, the object. You have another option. This is option one. This is option two. For option two, you can use localized meshing. So localized meshing means you set 0 0.25 for the uh, outer domain, for example, and you can refine your object here to have a smaller value, for example, because remember, we refine our mesh specifically at the region where we are interested to uh, extract the value from. So, because we are interested to see the flow passing through the turbine here, sorry, uh, passing through the object here. So, we just uh, refine the mesh at this interface or at this object. So, you can use localized meshing. Basically, you set 0 0.25 for the outer domain and you can set the object as a localized meshing 
where you can specify a smaller value for the face and also for the edges of the object. So this is what you're going to do for your second lab and also for your case study, hopefully. Okay, so local sizing. Okay. So this is a, a more powerful and you will notice the difference between using global machine and uh, localized machine in your lab. Okay. All right, so uh, I think I'm going to stop here for this lesson. Uh, I'll see you in the next uh, lesson. Thank you, everyone.